Listen, I did film and television studies at university for three years. I spent hours reading countless books and articles on subjects spanning from film all the way to television. Not a single one mentioned Hugh Grant once. I achieved the hardest qualification across any university or college ever, a 2-1 in history. Let me tell you, the only thing that I learned was that we, as a society, have a history of denying and neglecting Hugh Grant's artistic and cultural relevance, not just in this country, but in the entire world. I met Oscar at a Hugh Grant-themed event I put on at the Students' Union. It felt as though Diggory and I were the only ones there and we agreed that there was a Hugh Grant-shaped hole in academia. We decided to put it right ourselves. We want to show people that he's an icon in acting. We want to show people he's more than just a bumbling posh guy. I'm Diggory Waite. And I'm Oscar Beardmore Gray. And, and this, this is... Take it Hugh for granted. Hello and welcome to Taking Hugh for Granted, the podcast in which two Hugh Grant enthusiasts watch every single film starring Hugh Grant in the attempt to answer the simple question, is this film taking Hugh for granted? Is this film good on its own or does it rely on the bumbling Brit for its acclaim? I'm Degree Waite and I'm joined as always by my friend and fellow Hugh Grant obsessive Oscar Bidmore Gray. Oscar, how the bloody hell are you doing mate? I'm doing very well Dig. Thanks, thanks as always for the kind introduction. How are you doing, mate? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. Uh, I mean, you know, it's another week. Like, listeners won't know this um, because of how we record things, but Hugh Grant was trending on Twitter today. That's always a great time. That's, That's always, always the buzz. Fun. Yes, maybe we. Sh- I should probably have... It was, a, it was a little sort of little Twitter game where people were riffing on Hugh Grant's name. So Hugh Grant, if he was a cow, Moo Grant. Um, <laughs> Hugh Grant, if he was in a litigation battle, Sue Grant. I love um, say say the philosophy one. That was the best one. Well, thank you very much. That was a degree weight original special. Um, Hugh Grant, if he took up philosophy, Hugh Kant. Um, <laughs> for is that Emmanuel Kant? Your Emmanuel um, Kant? Kant? I, or is it Kant? Kant, Kant. It is Kant. Fuck, so I've sure. ruined it. Hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> hang on, let me try this again. <laughs> I don't even get my own fucking joke. I don't even say. I don't even know how to say my own joke properly. Um, Hugh Grant, if he took up philosophy, Immanuel Kant. Um, no, <laughs> what's going on here? You can't. Hugh so, Kant. It sounds, it sounds quite close to another thing, yes. thing that begins with a K or a C and ends in a T. Indeed, but, indeed. But it, it was. Like- I thought it was funny. We all laughed. We all had a great laugh. We all had a great laugh. Um, so go and check those out. I'm not sure. I mean, it's weeks in the future now, but I'm sure you can find them on our Twitter page if you scroll down long enough. Um, that was great fun. Always great fun. Oscar, today, the film we're reviewing, Small Time Crooks. Should we get into it? Let's get into it, Diggs. Boom. Small Time Crooks, directed by Woody Allen and released in 2000. Dishwasher and Small Fry Criminal Ray, played by Woody Allen, plots with his partners in crime to reopen a local pizza restaurant so they can dig underneath it through to the bank a few doors down. As they can't cook pizza, they bake cookies to sell instead. And while the diggers get lost underground, the cookie operation really takes off. Suddenly, the would-be crooks find themselves as rich business people but the other local money isn't quite ready to accept them. Mm. Great Mm. synopsis there from Synopsis Simon. I love the way he says, I mean, most people would say restaurant, but he says restaurant. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Very cultured. (laughs) Indeed, very cultured. And what, what a perfect segue to Hugh Grant in this film, the very epitome of culture. Um, (laughs) What did you think of Hugh Grant in this film? Well, I mean, as always, we should we should start with his look, Diggs. And absolutely, he he. I mean, he's he's pretty dapper in this film. He wears mm. some very interesting outfits. So, so Hugh Grant is a is an art dealer uh, in New York, and we we've seen this character before. <laughs> we have, we have. You know, a couple years later in uh, Mickey Blue Eyes, of course, he is a art dealer. Um, you know, he gets himself in the wrong in the in the wrong circles with the mafia there. Uh, this one, he's not involved with the mafia, but he is an art dealer, and he 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 is cultured. 
He's got mm. these cravats and um, his hair sort of slicked back nicely. Mm. And he, there's, there's one scene where he is wearing flip-flops and a cravat. It is an odd look to say I didn't least. notice the flip-flops. Oh, I would have <laughs> written that down. The only thing I'd written down under Hugh Grant's name in my notes was cravat. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, the first film we see with him wearing flip-flops and he rocks it. Yeah, I mean, for a man of culture that he's supposed to be in this, I would not expect him to be wearing flip-flops. I mean, we have to explain. So his character is meant to be like... So, as I say, Woody Allen, uh, Frenchie, a.k.a. Tracy Ullman, they have come in some money, they've come in some cash, and now they're, you know, they're they're fraternising with the hoi polloi of, um, <laughs> of, New, of upper New York. Obviously, Hugh Grant is there, and... They they want to like learn how to be, oh god, cultured and civilized, and they want to know about stuff from him, and so he's meant to be the like epitome of culture and stuff. So that's why I'm just thinking the the flip flops really don't work <laughs> with that at all. The cravat absolutely, which I thought looked dreadful. <laughs> it was embarrassing because <laughs> it didn't go with his outfit. He looks like you say he looks like uh. Well, he, he, brings, he brings out the cravat twice though. He, yeah. I think there was one that was like blue and yellow and then I thought that <laughs> one was better than the first one. The first one I thought because because the first one I thought oh is this going to be a new thing that just like comes and, and stays but then, it, but then it goes again I thought was that just going to be the if it had just been that one scene where he's wearing it I would have found that so funny because it would have just been so random that he'd just been wearing it on that day because it like you say the rest of the outfit it doesn't work it doesn't work with it it's just an open collared shirt and some trousers like you like his usual look so it feels very odd what what trousers slash down like yeah what 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 was he wearing on his legs when he's wearing the the flip-flops I- I think he was just wearing some sort of white flannels, which seems to be oh, what wow. is, go- is go to here. Oh, wow, it's a lot of white flannels. Yeah. Well, I mean, did you? So, did you like the look? I think his hair was great. I thought, I thought the look was good. I, mm. I, what I always think about in in this period of Hugh Grant's career is that he's he's only four or five years away from you know his about a boy love actually mm. era, but he actually looks. A lot younger than that, I think mm. he looks. He looks a lot closer to the four weddings and funeral era of Hugh Grant, even though he's sort of slap bang in the middle of it. Yeah, being you know, this is a film from two thousand, so he. Ha- I I think he's he's still he's still riding that like, you know, the the curtains young the young Hugh Grant mm. look here, mm. and and I think his hair is a little bit shorter than we've seen it in other films, but mm. it's looking looking pretty good, I'd say. Yeah, I'd be I I would be very happy with that haircut now. I I think I thought it looked really really cool. So I I was completely vibing that. But then what about his character? Because he plays a bit of a he plays a bit of an interesting character here because so he's sort of enlisted to help um particularly Frenchie try and integrate herself into the sort of upper classes so to speak. Mm. And it it takes quite a nasty turn where she starts to maybe fall for him a little bit. Uh, mm. understand me because everyone keeps in the film keeps saying he has great looks he's young blah, blah all this sort of stuff he's very cultured but then he reveals to we're not really sure who this person is <laughs> I think someone that works with him but he's like oh this this lady's got a lot of cash and mm. she's falling for me and if we get together then I can make a lot of money here and you think oh you bastard Oliver you know, it's dawning on me that uh, the opportunity has arisen for me to become quite uh, you know, quite obscenely rich how serious are they about building an art collection? No, no, it's not that. That's, uh, that would be peanuts. What, then? Well, I think that she might be falling for me. Frenchie Winkler? No, yeah, I mean, how much, how much do you think she's worth, roughly? Her husband, you mean? No, no, she, uh, it's all in her name. She is, she's the cookie mogul. What are you saying? I don't know. I suppose I'm saying that, uh, you know, people grow and marriages sadly break up and... Women remarry, you know. Fortunes, they, they change hands. It's funny, I was reading a review of this film um, and it, I mean, it was saying that he played... It, it was... It, it was Actually, it was a re- review. It was just talking about, you know, the top ten Hugh Grant films that you haven't seen yet starring Hugh Grant. I'm glad that they put number one, Lair of the White Worm. Love that. Um, but this featured somewhere in that. And mm. They said in it, they were like, this shows that Hugh can play slapstick and Hugh can play up and play, you know, and he can do big roles too. He doesn't just play serious stoic like in About a Boy and blah, blah, blah. You know, he doesn't just play realistic roles. He plays, he can play it up and ham it up. And I was like, sorry, I 
I actually think, for me, I think he was the most level character in this, in a way. Like, mm. the rest of the characters, you have characters like Tommy, Benny, They're, be ri- they're ridiculous. They're ridiculous. They're, 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 <laughs> that, they're, they're mental. <laughs> they're just like New York caricatures who, yeah. like, you know... Are small time crooks who small-time are idiots, crooks, schemers, who... plotters, planners. Yeah, exactly. Wheeler dealers. Yeah, and and actually, do you know what? Maybe this is a good t- time to a good, a good example of that is so the, as you, as you heard from synopsis, Simon, they've bought this shop. The cookies are selling well, but underneath it, they're trying to like knock through. And the first, they're trying to knock through, create this tunnel to rob a bank. The first knock in the wall that they make immediately punctures a, a water pipe. <laughs> Started yet? What do you mean you ain't started yet? What are you waiting for? The drilling season? Hey, do me a favor, go upstairs and bake, will you? I, I you know, you know I, I don't need any help. You got it? You know, you better brace me. Okay, okay, okay. That genuinely, I was on my, I was, I was falling about laughing. Like that was, that was really funny. It was class. But that's the kind of film we're dealing with here. So. When Hugh comes in and understandably plays a character that's meant to be cultured, civilized, you know, all those horrible words, and and you know, in stoic and stuff, he plays that completely dead and very and really quite straight. And in in, in some ways, I kind of wish maybe he had added a bit more of his a bit personality, more, a bit yeah, and a bit more parody, maybe a bit more um, pantomime to it. But then mm. that's my issue is, you know, in the same breath, I'm sure. If in an alternate universe he had done that, I might well be sitting here and going, bloody hell, Hugh, chill my pantomime, mate. Um, so who knows? I think you're right, Diggs, because, you know, we see a film like Nine Months, for for example, mm. where he is he is handed up to that pantomime oh, level, yeah. which is just almost bearing on the ridiculous. <laughs> and here is kind of the opposite. He's He is playing a lot more of a straight character than... The, the Woody Allen character and mm. the Frenchy character, which is almost like a kind of like, like you say, a sort of old school traditional comedy where, you know, people are just too stupid for their own, like they don't know what they're doing or like mm. the pipe bursts, the, you know, they get the wrong jewelry mixed up and that kind of thing. It's like quite mm. traditional comedy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it's it's a tough one because, you know, in, in, any, any, you know, low level comedian will be will be like well you need a straight man and you need a silly man and in this film you would probably say the only straight man is Hugh Grant as in like he he's and which is odd because he is in in a sense a cameo and sort of a pantomime villain so you'd sort of think why isn't he you know the one hamming it up but also I, I mean this might be you know novice comic stuff that doesn't make any sense but i remember someone saying that they were like great comedy is one of two things it's either ridiculous people in normal situations and it's and it's their ridiculousness and their stupidity sometimes that makes these normal situations crazy and funny or it's a ridiculous situation with normal people in it and that's what then the hilarity ensues from that this Mm. film is ridiculous people in a ridiculous situation (laughs) and and Hugh is the only one out of step with that. It feels mm. like in his performance, and that's. But as I say, it, it's a real tough one because I say that, but I still very much enjoyed watching him on screen, and I still think he completely served the purpose. I just wonder if maybe he could have had a bit more fun with it, and maybe the film could have afforded him that. And I'd be, I'd be sat here being like, "Wasn't Hugh jokes, bro?" Well, I'm taking Hugh. Oscar, let's address the elephant in the room, so to speak. The bespeckled, short <laughs> Manhattan... I don't know if he's Manhattan. I don't know where he's from. Um, elephant in the room. Um, Woody Allen, who I think this day and age is a divisive figure because of, um, I'm contractually obliged to say, all sorts of allegations. Um, but he, he can't, it's a very divisive figure these days. But I think this was the first of a five film deal with DreamWorks, you know, which was big money, a big deal for Woody Allen, who at the time was still like absolutely smashing it. And 
Hugh Grant has spoken about it in interviews. He really likes Woody Allen and, his, and Woody Allen's films. Like he, he, he's, he like, like many people of a certain generation, you know, which they, some of them will listen to this now going, fucking hell, they think I'm so old. But, um, but a lot of people <laughs> will think that, that, you know, that they, that they grew up with Woody Allen films or they, or they watched them when they were, you know, in their twenties or thirties or whatever, and they thought they were great. And, Hugh Grant is one of those people, and so I think there might be an element to that where he came, and he may have been a bit starstruck, and he may have been a bit like, "Shit, I want to get this right. This is so cool that I'm doing this." Mm. Um, well, I was going to say, I mean, this is one of those films where there hasn't been a lot in the media about it. There's not a lot you can find on YouTube. There's not many yeah. interviews of Hugh, even though it's a big. It's, it was quite a big film at the yeah. time, and. It, if you know when we interview Hugh in person this is the kind of film <laughs> I want to like get down and dirty mm. with and ask him these questions like you know Hugh has worked with a lot of big directors but mm. there aren't many bigger ones at that time like ni- the 1990s early 2000s Woody Allen like like you said there may have been an element of being starstruck here but we alluded to it just before now about how there are you know lots of people will f- fondly remember his films and I think this film has uh, if you haven't seen a uh, Woody Allen film before, a lot of people, it's quite funny actually, have been like, oh, this is just, a, like, it's Woody Allen makes the same film over and over again, and this is just another one that's exactly the same. And Woody Allen plays the same character, and it's the same sort of film. And it's funny because obviously Hugh gets the same thing thrown at him all the time. Um, I, I, but I think for me anyway, one of the, one of the film's big strengths is the fact that it is a Woody Allen film in the sense that it's a funny, punchy kind of mad script the i think i think like the dialogue between the characters like it, like the first five or ten minutes it just like a thousand characters speaking a thousand miles an hour like punchlines and jokes everywhere and it's just kind of this mad just like people yelling at each other and stuff and it's re- it is fun and it's really engaging frenchy i don't get your agreeance on this i count the three it's going to be trouble you can count to 53 ray and you won't get it i did a lot of nails for that money and it's all we got and that's what you want to do your whole life nails take a hike take a hike okay frenchy i'm i'm count i'm telling you i'm counting i oh, swear yeah? if i lose it frenchy oh. you're gone oh, i'm quaking in it. my pantyhose Oh, uh, I, you're embarrassing me in front of my friends. Well, you can have one of my cookies. I can't have a cookie? Oh, guys, what's up? Oh, hey, did you get your share? My share of what? Oh, oh, yeah, I got it. I sold some stuff. What'd you sell? A rented car. He can't get his end. I can get my end. What are you telling him? She won't give it to him. So I guess the candy didn't work then. Now, you said you'd have her eaten out of your hand. Will you shut up or clean her around, Dick? All that's missing from this guy is a piece of velvet and a pet mouse. Frenchie, give me the money. Will you give me the money? I wouldn't invest our last six thou if you had a legit idea, much less something that's going to land the three of you jerks back in stir. We didn't grow up with Woody Allen films. Certainly mm. I didn't. I don't think I've seen... I, I can't remember if I've seen any Woody mm. Allen films, to be honest. I don't really know much about him. My the, the thing that I found kind of interesting off the bat was the fact that he is playing, you know, he's 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 the main character. Like how mm. off like you don't often see directors go in and like be the main character just mm. of, of the movie. Like is that was that common for Woody Allen to do? Mate, that? that's his big deal. That's his thing. Yeah. That's his thing. Okay, yeah. that's his like Okay, so uh, now I'm sounding like, like an idiot. <laughs> well, no, but this, but it's interesting. I think people it would be interesting to hear because it, I, I mean, I'm sat, I sat here, you know, pretending like I'm this big Woody Allen. Oh, I know it all thing. I don't. I think I've seen. I think I may have seen Manhattan. I think I may have seen the one with the girl and the and the red coat or whatever it's called. I don't know what it's even called. Um, it's a Red Riding Hood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, people might be screaming at like, wherever they listen to this, be like, they know what it is, but. Yeah, they'll know what it is. Um, God, that's going to really piss me off now. That's what it is. But I, but, but I'm not by any means. I'm very similar to you. I may have seen, but I might have seen a couple. But I know the sort of tropes of a Woody Allen film. That's the best I can say. But I know that that's mm. the thing. But obviously, particularly later, he stopped acting his films as much. I think. But yes, so it's interesting to, to hear what you thought about it not having that. You know, well, I think you know. the sort of thing that struck me about him the most is that, like, he's a he's an odd looking guy. I mean, he's, <laughs> yeah, he's a really like he's stick thin, stick yeah. thin. Like yeah. his hair is really bad. Um, <laughs> you know, he's yeah. eighty five now, so he was about sixty five then, and he looks mm. he looks like he's about eighty in the film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's a small bloke, isn't he? Like he's a tiny yeah. little guy. Um. <laughs> And there's some just great shots of when you do get his full profile in, as particularly next to Tracy and uh, also say Frenchy, and 
yeah, and you and you, you just see the the disparity uh, that you just see the difference in 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 their heights, and particularly where some of his outfits, where he's wearing these sort of high waisted shorts and like socks pulled up really high. I think that's probably part of the look. Mm. He looks like someone from our old university, Bristol, trying to look cool at a festival. Um, but he did he did look ridiculous. Taking he for granted. Taking he for granted. Taking he for granted. What did you think, lads? Were they taking he for granted? Oscar, small time crooks, are we taking Hugh for granted? Diggs, it's a it's a hard, I think this is a hard one. I think from, I don't often sit on the fence. I feel like I feel like you're mm. a sen- you're a fence sitter. I absolutely uh, am, yeah. But I, it's really hard to come down on one side here because as we discussed, I th- I thought Hugh was good in this film, and I think it's one that would have enhance his reputation in his cv like he's come in like you said the first of five films in a woody allen dreamworks deal this is quite a sort of a well-established cast mm. with trace yorman and woody allen and there's a few other guys who You're are recognized from friends yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's um don from prison break and that he i think he's yeah. also in friends that guy <laughs> Class. um michael rapper i think his name is mm. um he's quite a big deal mm. so there's a you know this this is you know he's walked into New York. He's walked into a new setting, and he and he and he's done the job. Let's let's be honest. Mm, mm. Um, but overall, I'm gonna say it's not taking Hugh for granted. Mm, mm. I think I'm just gonna land on that because I think that Hugh did a good job, and I think the film it it was a it was a decent film for the mm. time. I think it was a decent film, and if you watched it in the cinema, I don't think you would be coming out of it and thinking I wasted my evening. Absolutely not. No, I I think I think I am going to hop off the fence for once and come over to your side and hang out with you, even though, nice. you know, socially distance, of course, um, because, um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, even though we spent the majority of this review, or at least I did, being like, you could have acted this differently. I still think it was fine and it was great. And, you know, it, it, yeah. And the first I, I was I sat there thinking as well, the first like 30 minutes of this film it just feels like a great episode of your favorite TV show. It feels like something like Always Sunny in Philadelphia. The gang have some new crackpot idea, and it just feels like a really tight, great episode of your favorite TV show. There's some great gags in there. It's kind of like it's kind of it, it feels homely and funny and quick and punchy, and it's great. And then they amass their fortune, and the film shifts from being a heist like comedy to a, a comedy about the you know the difference between the working class and the upper classes and stuff interesting themes but you know nowhere near the same level of like punches funniness however overall it is funny i do like the script you know woody allen whatever you think about him his performance is great he's just always he's just constantly like his like stumbling over his words like i am now and and being annoyed about something and like looking frustrated exactly yeah. and, and it's, there's something so like it is just enjoyable to watch i think i think we should say that i think tracy ullman and woody allen's chemistry on screen was yeah. pretty good like they Brilliant. they they sh- like they epitomize like a kind of couple who love each other but just constantly like bickering Bicker. and yeah. fighting over things. She was and being brilliant. like, "You're crap and you're rubbish. Oh, I hate you." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they and they both deliver those lines, those cutting, searing lines on each other with like, it, it, "This is brilliant. It is so so great." So you're absolutely right. So, it, yeah, that's why. I, I, can I say at any point that I was like bored? No. Was I did I enjoy it the whole way through for different aspects of it? Absolutely. So yeah, I'm gonna say this film is not taking you for granted. I think also, just on a personal level for Hugh, he would have been happy to have done this. He would have worked with one of I'm gonna go out there and say heroes. I don't know that for certain, but I think the, I'm, I could <laughs> <laughs> making assumptions. You know Hugh so well, you're making assumptions about him now. Love Fuck it. it. Why not? I mean, the only person he would love to have well, he would love to have worked with more is anyone who worked on The Sound of Music, which is his favourite film. Um, but who he knows? He's probably gutted about the fact that the, um, the what, what was his face? Died recently. The, the Captain Von um, Trapp guy. Oh no, Died really? Recently. Oh, I'm sure he uploaded something on Twitter. Well, it's time for our final hurrah, I think. Um, I would love for you to let us know if you've seen this film or what you think. Because... Yeah, I mean, it, 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 yeah, it it could be it could be divisive, but it's diff- I mean, it's just it's you know, it's just a bit of fun. Yeah, it's a hard one to judge this one, so I would yeah. be interested to know what the fans think. Yeah, so get in touch. Get in touch. We are at taking you for granted on 
Instagram and Facebook, at Taking You on Twitter, Taking You for Granted at gmail.com if you want to send us an email. Other than that, stay tuned. If you're listening to us on whatever platform you're listening and you're not followed yet, give us a follow. We will have another episode out in at least two weeks where we will review another great Hugh Grant film or a bad one. We'll let you know at the end of the episode. Um, fantastic. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. It's goodbye from me. It's goodbye from me. Bye. Bye. Taking Hugh for Granted is produced, edited, and presented by Diggory Waite and Oscar Beardmore Gray. The producers of Taking Hugh for Granted would like to state that this podcast is in no way associated with the actor Hugh John Mungo Grant, nor does it endorse his views or represent him in any way. Instead, by creating this podcast, Oscar and Diggory hope to celebrate Hugh's illustrious career, reliving his old classics and shedding light on some of his hidden gems. Hugh. If you're listening, we hope you approve.